This is Duke University. Poverty, malnutrition, constant chronic experiences with discrimination that create uh, chronic stress that can erode the body's resilience and immune system and underlying chronic health problems that disproportionately impact uh, communities of color and the poor. Today's talk can uh, generate some interesting discussion that's helpful to you as you um, come together and think about creating a, a curriculum and a, a minor in um, human rights. I am a scientist by training. I spend a lot of time crunching numbers, collecting data, um, doing air sampling, those kinds of things. But I am interested in questions of environmental justice, which motivates my research. I have become very interested in the role of social movements, uh, and health social movements in particular, and the ways that it has, they have reshaped scientific thinking about environmental health problems and forced scientists like myself, as well as scientists in the regulatory community, to do better science, so to speak. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Environmental justice activism has really forced scientists to wrap our brains around uh, what I like to call the triple jeopardy of social and environmental inequity. And these have three components. We're talking about disparities and exposures to hazards. They can be defined in a myriad of different ways, occupational, air quality, traffic density, water, I mean, you know, the list goes on. Social vulnerability are what I call extrinsic factors. In other words, uh, poverty, food insecurity in neighborhoods, chronic exposure to psychosocial stressors uh, in the places where you live or where you work, uh, lack of health care access, experiences with racism and gender roles, and then biological susceptibility. Um, <clears throat> people in my field and the regulatory community are very good at focusing on these, so we tend to worry about kids and the elderly being more vulnerable. These are intrinsic factors that have to do with your, with your, bi with your underlying biology. And so uh, the idea is that a lot of these things can come together and you may have interactive or additive effects which uh, may at least partially be driving um, observed health disparities either in mortality or in, in, in different kinds of diseases that are caused by both environmental and social factors. This is looking at <coughs> rates of um, chronic hypertension during pregnancy among women disaggregated by race. So this is African Americans. This is the average for the entire population, and then this blue is our um, whites, and then these are uh, Latinos, our uh, Latina mothers. And so you can see overall there's a trend towards increasing rates of pregnancy-related hypertension, um, and we're not quite sure why. This is a very short period of time to see this increase, so it's definitely not like genetic. Uh, likely to have some environmental factor associated with it. People are still trying to figure it out. But the other thing that you see is there is a persistent racial disparity, and it appears to be widening. Okay, this has not gone away. This, this disparity has only gotten actually wider as rates have increased for everybody. This is a study that we did a couple of years ago where we looked at the adverse effects on birth weight associated with particulate matter in the air. Particulate matter is a, is a pretty severe lung irritant. Uh, it is regulated under the Clean Air Act. Um, it has a health-based standard associated with it. Um, and so what we wanted to see was that whether women who lived in um, higher particulate matter areas were more likely to suffer birth weight decrements compared to women who lived in lower particulate matter areas. And so anything that's below zero here indicates that uh, PM is associated with a decrease in birth weight. Okay? So you can see, and the, the different colors here represent uh, the different uh, race or ethnicity as self-identified by the mother on the, on the birth certificate. So you can see that um, there is a slight decrement in average birth weight for women who are living in higher PM areas, and you see a pretty strong effect for PM 2.5. But the other interesting thing that you see is that this effect is much stronger for African American women compared to other mothers, okay? Regardless of how you, and particularly for these forms of, of PM 10. So um, this suggests a potentially interactive effect by race, which is not likely to be uh, genetic, but it but probably have so something to do with something else. This is a study that I uh, did several years ago um, where we looked at um, modeled air toxics exposures by census tract for the entire United States, all cities in the United States. 
And we combine that with um, chemicals that we know are likely probable or possible carcinogens to estimate what your cancer health risks would be based on what we know about the exposures in these census tracts if someone were to live there for a lifetime. So these are estimates. These are not actual dead bodies. This is looking at uh, pollution, estimated lifetime cancer risks associated with multiple air toxics. So this is low and this is high cancer risk or high pollution burden. And then what we did was we um, disaggregated our data by cities that have low to moderate levels of racial residential segregation, cities that are high, and then cities that are hyper-segregated or extreme segregated. And then each one of these lines represents a racial or ethnic group as defined by the U.S. Census. And so the take-home message here are, are two things. One is, not surprisingly, we see more racial disparities in pollution burdens among people who live in hypersegregated cities. That's not surprising. But what the other thing that we see is that overall, um, people who live in more segregated cities have higher pollution burdens in general. So as you can see, this blue line represents white residents. White residents who live in extremely segregated cities are, tend to live in environments that have higher pollution burdens compared to their white counterparts that live in less segregated cities. So overall, this gets at this question of um, the links between social inequality and overall environmental quality. All this suggests that <clears throat> um, place-based inequalities and stress um, can have and enhance the adverse health effects of en environmental hazards. And this really, I think, helps scientists do a better job in what um, EJ advocates are demanding, that we better link the connections between social inequality and environmental health and how much, to what extent this is driving the persistence and origins of health disparities in the United States that we're having a hard time getting a handle on. This is a very interesting data set that anyone can access and uh, we, uh, they, it has a very interesting question because they ask participants who are in the survey to self-identify their race or ethnicity. But then the second question they ask them is, how do you think other people perceive you? Okay, um, and uh, so you can get at people who may identify as a person of color, but who may report being perceived, for example, as white, okay, um, which is useful. So people like me, Latinas of Pallor, I'd like to say, you know, um, I identify as a Latina, but, you know, I walk down the street and people, that's not the first, first thing that people come to people's minds, and that affects my experience in the world, what happens to me when I walk into a store or whatever. With increasing levels of segregation, uh, Latinos who reported uh, being perceived as Latinos reported thinking, having, thinking about their race more often. Okay? These are Latinos who are reported being perceived as white. You don't see that same effect. So this suggests that both sort of how you're perceived but place, place matters in terms of how, how it affects your, um, your experience in the world. We also looked at other dimensions like people's experience of discrimination and seeking health care. Same patterns. So what happens to you physiologically when you undergo and are experiencing chronic psychosocial stress a lot. And when you think about it in social justice terms, what is the biological experience of everyday experiences with discrimination, unconscious or otherwise, or the biological experience of constantly living with material deprivation? These are nucleotides that appear at the end of our chromosomes when they're functioning well they uh, protect the chromosome during, during cell division. As we get older, the length of these caps at the end of the chromosome naturally get shorter. Okay, That's part of the aging process. Um, <clears throat> but as you can see, there's a lot of variability in telomere length throughout the life course. And so uh, this, this uh, biomarker is being used as a biomarker of stress response or premature cellular aging. And people are looking at that in relationship to people's reported experiences with different kinds of stress, either acute stress or chronic stress. And we recruited um, mothers who were seeking prenatal care in San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, overwhelmingly, our population was um, Latina uh, because uh, this is a hospital that provides prenatal care services and delivery services for women who don't have health insurance. We measured their telomere length. So this is only looking at Latinas. But the interesting thing is we found a lot of variability among our Latina participants in terms of their telomere length. We found Shorter telomeres among Latinas who were born, who were foreign born compared to their US born counterparts. Shorter is premature aging, higher level of, 
biomarker of stress response. Which is interesting because it counteracts some of the theories about so-called the healthy immigrant effect and these kinds of things. The question is why and if this is real. Our new study and larger cohort is going to try and answer this question. It's but just asking them how they perceive their social status in their community. This is a very uh, frequently used question in health studies and has been validated to be pretty predictive of self-rated health and actual health status. And um, you can see that uh, U.S. born Latinas tended to rank themselves higher in the latter compared to their foreign born counterparts. Um, similarly, um, foreign born Latinas uh, tended to have um, <coughs> lower scores in terms of their perception of their neighborhoods compared to their U.S. born counterparts. They were the ones that were more likely to say, I would move out of this neighborhood if I could. So the question is this is all very interesting, lots of science not all of it totally conclusive and EJ advocates are like cool that's great science what are you going to do about it now because we need to do something now we are you know trying to uh, work with uh, community groups particularly in California the California Environmental Justice Alliance which is a consortium of environmental justice groups from throughout the state some of which are very locally based um, and some of which have more regional focus um, <coughs> we have embarked on a collaboration with um, the California Environmental Justice Alliance to develop what we call an environmental justice screening methodology, which is basically to develop a tool that can be used to inform regulatory action now. Um, and it's a mapping tool, it's a visual tool. Um, and the California Air Resources Board um, and ca the California Environmental Protection Agency has was very motivated to fund us to do this because they had there's a lot of legislation that has environmental justice language in it and they're required by law to pay attention to these issues but they didn't quite have the tools to figure out how to do this so community engagement is a continuum and so when we think about curriculum development for example we want students to do this kind of work particularly in a semester you know here's here's the thing that community organizations hate that what we call helicopter science People go in, they collect their data, they leave, they never come back, communities never know what happened. <clears throat> We're obviously trying to move things more in this direction where there's more participation, opinions might be actively solicited, uh, to you actually have your community partners and they're involved from the get-go, from the proposal writing to the data collection to interpretation and dissemination of results. Okay? And, Depending on your situation, you may you, you know you can fall anywhere on this continuum, and that's okay. I mean, you don't want to do helicopter science, obviously. But um, so when you're thinking about course development, um, you may not always be able to be here. That takes a lot of time. It takes the, a lot of these projects I've been involved in have been for years. Okay, students have a semester. We still grapple with these questions, though. How are we going to institutionalize this work and have stabilize our funding? How do we keep this work always grounded in racial and social justice questions? This is the American culture's requirement, after all. Um, how do we sustain these partnerships with community groups and make the university accountable to these community partnerships over the long term? Um, and then how do we uh, provide better financial support? We provide financial support, but it would be great if we could provide more. I think things have, things have gotten better in, in some ways, in at least in California. There's a lot of... There's, it's not that everyone's in agreement, but there's uh, an, an effort to try and work together on the things where there is agreement, particularly on statewide policy. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.